Now, Danielle, I uh, was going to be doing a half hour presentation on the new state of play for carbon mitigation. Danielle, we are very glad to have you join us today. Uh, I am uh, who is from Green Economy Canada, uh, our program I had mentioned that is from coast to coast here in Canada, and they've been doing some very exciting things and they have led us in our own program. Um, so Danielle Lapierrier is the network engagement manager at Green Economy Canada. Danielle recognizes that businesses uh, are the most powerful force we have to accelerate transition in a low carbon economy as, as strive to leverage that force. And as very true as entities, businesses do carry a lot of sway, which is why we do this program because businesses as an individual uh, do have a lot of social, uh, social authority. Uh, she has a bachelor, uh, I was thinking that's in science, BS. I, um, Am I right on that? Bachelor of Education in Science and Development University of Waterloo. What does that stand for, Danielle? Um, bachelors of Environmental Studies. Oof, man, geez. Uh, I tell you guys, I, I of course, uh, have, uh, you know, I'm educated in communications. So every time I come across all these fantastic uh, certifications in the environment, I always like learning what they mean. Uh, and of course, she has a master, she, she has an MBA in green from Green Mountain College. So <laughs> Danielle, before I butcher any more of this, <laughs> please, dear God, take, take the reins. Presentation is yours and feel free to share your screen. Sounds good, David. I think that I've taken over screen sharing and you now see uh, my screen. If you could give me a thumbs up, that would be very helpful. Are we um, thumbs up on that? Not yet. My, uh, our oh. studio man. Oh, there we go. We got a thumbs up now. Okay, awesome. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me. And it's a tough act to follow. What an incredible group of panelists you're able to put together. Um, I've really, uh, there's so much that I've taken away from that panel to inspire myself, but also to think back to the impact of a network and what Green Economy Canada is really all about is that impact of a network, collective businesses or individuals who are taking action um, to reduce their environmental impact um, individually and then see and learn from that impact collectively. So as David and Simon mentioned earlier, Green Economy Canada is a national nonprofit. Um, we're focused on accelerating the transition to a low carbon economy, specifically by engaging businesses and most recently really focusing on engaging small and medium sized businesses who don't always have the support necessary to start to think about um, measuring their, their impact and changing that impact. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the state of carbon mitigation or the new state of play in carbon mitigation. Um, I've taken this with a lens uh, about, you know, what the what we're hearing in the news about commitments and needs to act on climate change, and then why it's really important to businesses. And then there's already been really great ideas in the forum today about what to do, but I'll give a few more examples and case studies of uh, ways that businesses can take action right now and contribute to, to this need. So let's start a little bit about what we've heard in the news. So many organizations are setting GHG reduction targets net zero targets are really picking up steam. It's all that's been in the news leading up to um, COP26. And so from organizations like Maple Leaf Foods, which became the first and only food company in Canada to adopt a science-based target, to the G7 meeting in early June to agree to reaching net zero targets by 2050, and IKEA setting a net zero target for 2030, there's tons of headlines out there that we could pull. So big or small, a lot of businesses and actors are working together towards the same purpose. And climate targets have existed since the early 1990s when scientists first started ringing the alarm bells about global warming and climate change. And the most recent round of global climate targets came out of the Paris Climate Accords in 2015, which set ambitious targets for each country to make by 2030 and, 20, and a roadmap towards who would be responsible for emissions. And over the next two weeks, world leaders, business leaders, scientists and activists from across the globe are meeting together at COP26 in Glasgow to work out more details on the how of those targets, how they can actually effectively deliver those commitments. But unfortunately, we still face quite an uphill battle Despite previous global commitments, there's still a long way to go to address climate change. The International Panel on Climate Change released its most recent report earlier this year. It took a look at global emissions and our progress towards them, as well as the outcomes of not meeting those targets. 
The report is clear. The science is clear. Despite commitments to reduce global carbon emissions, they're still rising and we're nudging closer and closer to a 1.5 degree Celsius rate, um, rise in uh, average global temperatures above pre-industrial averages. And deep changes are required to maintain that commitment to 1.5 degrees C. And our remaining carbon budget is shrinking quickly with only seven years worth of carbon at the global, uh, at the global pace of emissions right now before we reach 1.5 C and about 25 years to avoid two, two degrees Celsius in warming. But let's start to bring it down a little more locally um, from the global context towards Canada. Uh, this picture kind of shows where global carbon emissions or where Canadian emissions are coming from. There's many graphics out there that map this in different ways from industry to activity use. But at the end of the day, I really like this one because it shows us areas or things that we all know things about. Businesses and homes um, uh, use electricity and produce waste. We, those things are, are are relevant to us, we know about them at home. Everyone's in a building right now, unless um, it's some sort of glorious weather up there in, in Sudbury, I don't have that here. <laughs> um, I think you're all in buildings. We all know that there's impacts to where we are. There's impacts to our food systems and how we move around every day. Um, and, and of course, the people who employ us, uh, heavy industry and oil and gas are major employers in Canada and also major contributors to our emission profile. So there has to be some systemic change in how, um, how those industries operate and help us transition. And when we think about Canada's progress, we're really good nationally at setting targets. We set a Rio target back around 2000. Many people know about the Kyoto uh, targets and Copenhagen and most recent Paris. Now, most of those target dates have passed and our emissions are still well above them. We haven't achieved those historic targets. And even as Paris approaches with the 2030 targets, our emissions are projected as business as usual to flatline, but continue along this blue horizon, nowhere near what we've committed to. And even if everything that was done or committed to in the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change, uh, introduced about five, five years ago now, um, there's still a gap on what we need to do. So there's an important role to accelerate this transition and a role for, for businesses to be a part of that so that we can actually meet that target and stand up and say that to future generations, hey, we said what we did what we said we would do and we made a difference. So when it comes to all of, when it comes to global climate change, we hear a lot about the global imperative and these numbers feel really far away from maybe individual or business action. So I wanna spend a bit of time and think about what the business drivers are for sustainability. And these always differ depending on what industry you're a part of or your geographic location. But I've pulled out a few that we find are very common across the network uh, and their relative importance kind of might vary for you, but I hope some of them uh, resonate and you see it as a driver for your own business. Hi, it's Judy. I just like letting you know that- Judy and is still with us. Uh, hold one moment, I will, I'm gonna just mute her mic. <laughs> no problem, David. Um, so let's maybe just take a step back and think about what do we mean when we say sustainability or taking action on sustainability. So sustainability in its most basic concept is this idea that we meet the needs of today without compromising the needs of the future. And from a business perspective, corporate social responsibility is a company's commitment to manage the social environment and economic effects of its operations responsibility and align that with public expectations. In practical terms, I think this you can think about this as meaning looking at how your business operations impact your broader stakeholders and the planet and working to maximize social and environmental performance in addition to financial performance. And for a really long time, business, many businesses undertook sustainability, largely did so because they felt it was the right thing to do. And I still think that's the case today. 
but there is a strong business case for taking action right now, um, coming to the forefront with investors and consumer decision making, uh, starting to align or require sustainability from organizations that they work with, as long alongside the requirements for financial and emissions reporting. So let's talk briefly about some of the drivers that we're seeing here at Green Economy Canada that are pushing businesses to take deeper action on climate change. Um, one of the first ones that we hear now is about attracting and retaining investors. So for medium or large size companies that are still in growth stage, they're seeing that investors have more and more evidence that show um, sustainable companies or companies with sustainability practices are less risky of an investment. They're more resilient resilient and they perform better over the long term. And a recent study showed that companies act, that actively manage and plan for climate change have an 18% higher return on investment for investors. So this is driving decision making in the financial world around who to invest in. In addition to that, I think the most common uh, driver that I've seen in my own experience in the sustainability realm is on saving money. I think this is where we get into those initial low hanging fruit projects that get you in the door. Um, buildings are really expensive to heat and every business operates out of some sort of building. Um, and the energy used in buildings accounts for about 30% of greenhouse gases globally. So reducing energy consumption often saves businesses money. And if that business is maybe a property owner, as in the example I have on the screen, it saves their tenants money too, which can make their properties more attractive. And in that particular case, commercial space is, uh, is abundant right now um, in, in Canada, but giving buildings, a, I'm sorry, sustainability performance or uh, energy performance gives buildings an edge over competition and helps uh, corporate landlords fill vacant spaces. Then we also hear um, about, this one is based on building managers, but attracting and retaining tenants. The same could be true about attracting and retaining clients for any type of business. More and more what we're hearing is that um, supply chains are requiring their up and downstream suppliers to think about sustainability and to report back to larger companies about what they're doing on sustainability. So attracting and retaining tenants in the case of a property manager or uh, uh, clients who uh, in the case of um, pretty much anyone else uh, is a major driver towards this work. And one of the really great and overlooked co-benefits of pursuing sustainability is the role that it can have in engaging employees. So in a post-COVID world, employees are expect expecting more from their employers than they have in the past. And by 2025, millennials will comprise about 75% of the workforce. And this demographic cares more about value-aligned employer employers than previous generations. In fact, 76 of millennials consider a company's social and environmental commitments when deciding where to work. So your sustainability work can be a, a differentiation differentiating factor on retracting and retaining employ employees, such an important uh, factor in this post-COVID world where the labor market is very competitive. Then there's the fact of risk management. Most businesses do some sort of risk analysis and they think through what kind of uh, impacts they might have. And when I did risk planning, we thought in a plastics facility, our number one risk we always thought about was fire and what that would mean to lose our facility in a, in a fire. So our risk management was around that. But over maybe the in the last couple of years that I was with an organization in Huntsville that was uh, producing plastic, plastic pipes, manufacturing plastic pipes, that number one risk really started to shift. It shifted to a supply chain risk because our raw materials were coming from Houston, Texas. And Houston, Texas was experiencing more frequent and severe hurricanes and deeper cold um, or deep freezes like they did in February of last year. And those disruptions in weather patterns way down in Houston impacted our supply of raw material for months, uh, forced companies into force majeure, and meant that for us, being able to deliver products to our end cl clients was at risk. 
So those were all climate related risks that we really started to have to think about in our own operations directly in Huntsville, but also in our supply chain and where we were choosing to get products from. And the last one I'll touch on is investing in sustainability is a really important way to avoid getting left behind. Movement on sustainability is happening more and more rapidly. We've seen the early adopters uh, lead in a lot of ways already. And we're starting to get to a stage where I can't go a week without seeing a Canadian company announce a net zero target. So regardless of what sector you, you are in, there's likely the, a business that's taking the lead on sustainability for your sector. And if there isn't, that really could be you. Um, I have a couple examples here just on the screen from our Green Economy Leader Directory on our website that highlights the about 300 companies that we've worked with to measure their footprint and reduce their impact. And they're just a few of the leaders in this space in Canada in particular. So if we know that maybe there's a really great business case to undertaking this work, it comes down to what can businesses do? And uh, Simon asked me to present because we recently attended a carbon mitigation course together. And that carbon mitigation course talked about four different levers uh, that businesses or, um, or countries have towards carbon, um, uh, towards addressing climate change. And I'm gonna just talk about the top two because I think those are the areas where businesses have the, uh, the biggest steps forward to make and also where we're most suitable to kind of supporting businesses to do that. So in mitigation, this is things like improving efficiency, fuel switching. So I heard lots of talk about electric vehicles, which is a, a kind of a great way to, to make that fuel switch, um, extending uses of products or eliminating needs in some cases. Um, and then in the second bucket here, there's sequestration and offsets. So some of this is our natural systems. Um, how do we uh, reforest or, or um, uh, to capture more carbon in our natural systems and also make a more beautiful environment for where we live and work? And more hard technology like carbon capture, utilization and storage that I'll get into a little later. So I'm gonna dig into those two a little bit and let's start with carbon mitigation. This very first bucket is, I think, in a lot of ways where businesses get started. You think about energy efficiency product, uh, uh, projects, um, but this can extend far beyond energy efficiency products, uh, uh, projects towards uh, projects that reduce your, um, uh, your, your, sorry, your waste, your water usage. Um, it could reduce um, the inputs into your system. So uh, concepts in manufacturing around lean uh, translate really well to carbon mitigation. And at Green Economy Canada, we like to group projects in this area into four broad categories of you know, behavioral, operational, procurement, and capital projects. And each have merits and drawbacks. And we, when we work with businesses to, to identify reduction opportunities and build a reduction plan, we suggest that they look at a mix of all of these because all of them can be a part of the solution. So I'm gonna take a bit closer look at each of these four types with some examples from our network of what folks have done. So the first is a behavior project. And um, just to give some context, a behavior project are kind of interventions that are planned that change people's decision-making and daily habits. So maybe your organization provides a financial incentive, like a subsidized bus pass for staff, and then takes transit to work to encourage conservation by placing signage near energy using equipment like printers or light switches. These projects are often low or no cost and can yield significant short-term and long-term reductions. Um, an example of this from our network is from Lafarge Canada in Edmonton's location in particular. They were able to reduce GHG emissions by 26% at basically zero cost using only behavioral initi initiatives. And their actions focused on, one of the actions, sorry, focused on an anti-idling campaign. And they did a very similar action action. They distributed key change to drivers that had anti-idling messages and clear, simple guidance on what to do to um, minimize the length of idling time. 
And it's important to remember that most effective behavioral interventions meet people at a place and time where the action or decision occurs and use clear and simple language and empower them to make a change and then also communicate back what the impact of that change was. Moving on to operational projects, these normally involve simple good housekeeping or maintenance or other procedures that could lead to a reduction in a reduction opportunity that don't need any further assessment, but that can be acted on right away. So this could be fixing leaks in a steam system or um, uh, broken glazing or windows in a shipping dock door that won't close or adding occupancy centers to low use areas. These things typically pay off immediately and don't have a big barrier to implementation and might have some additional co-benefits that are immediately um, visible. And a great example of that from our network is from your credit union. They installed a new building aut automation system to optimize electricity use. And this action alone shaved about 30% off of their annual electricity bills and reduced electricity com consumption to 130,000 kilowatts a year, which is enough to power 11 homes um, uh, in electricity use for a year. On the procurement side, these are projects that are sometimes higher in cost, but they generally involve how you purchase materials and making sure you're purchasing the most sustainable or low impact uh, product. Uh, I think uh, a good, actually don't, I didn't put an example, I don't think of this one on here. Um, in this particular example I have on the screen is a, more of a, a capital investment into EVs. Um, however, an example of this could be thinking about upgrading appliances or an electrician um, or electronics to Energy Star versions, or choosing to purchase um, recycled and fair trade certified paper, or um, contracting to a zero emissions delivery service for your products that are going to customers in your local area. If we move on to the idea maybe around capital projects, so these are shovel, often shovel in the ground kind of projects or technologies for equipment and infrastructure, and they sometimes have a higher price tag than behavioral and operations projects. And they may be linked to budget cycles and have formal approval processes. So of course, the purchase of an electric vehicle could be one of those. Another one is um, the installation of uh, out outdoor LED lighting, which happened in Conestoga Mall uh, across a period of two years and saved 156,000 kilowatts of electricity or 4.7 tons of GHG and also produced $28,000 in operational savings a year for the business. Um, these projects uh, typically need some leadership approval for and need to integrate into what you're thinking about in business. And I added two more here um, while Simon was talking, because I know Paul was supposed to be a part of the panel, and Paul's story at Veriform is really moving. Uh, at the highest level, uh, Paul's company is carbon neutral, and they've done that by implementing over 100 projects over the course of 10 years. And those projects reduced in emissions reductions of about 75% directly in the operation before they started to pursue off offsets by purchasing offsets from projects outside of Canada to reduce the equivalent of the balance, the 25%. And Paul's company did all of this while growing. They grew in floor space and employees, in profit margin and total sales. Um, and they saved a heck of a lot of money while doing it. They're a phenomenal case study. And if you haven't checked out Veriform in Cambridge, um, the story is on their website. And one final recent example I wanted to throw in because renewable energy is maybe uh, all the rage right now is that Hemans, which is um, a strawberry and farm and market uh, out in London, installed this year and went online this year, a 264 uh, panel solar array. And that will, produce 57% of the electricity that they use on site, um, the equivalent of powering about 11 homes in the area. And by doing this, Hemans has attracted both employees, but also customers. People come to see this project now and come to see the other things that Hemans has done on sustainability related to water and waste um, and soil management. So it's a driver for why people come to this business as a destination, not just a place to spend money. Um, and I know I'm, I'm getting tight for time here with just about five minutes left, but there's 
also a lot more beyond those four categories of projects or that notion that addressing climate change is all about energy efficiency, which certainly it is a major component of it. But the trends in the, in the industry are shifting more and more towards looking at holistic impacts, looking at what's happening upstream at the, um, for the products that are getting to you that are going into whatever you're producing. So that could be um, the cans that are coming to, to split rail, or for me, the plastic resin that's coming from Houston, Texas, as well as the downstream activity. What are consumers doing with your product? How are they disposing of it? How much energy does it use when, when they have it at home and what's its lifespan? Um, all of those questions uh, are, becoming increasingly important to address. <clears throat> and there's increasing interest to show leadership and opportunities to uh, address them in very innovative and unique ways. One of which is the idea of circular economy. Um, there's several concepts here that is shifting our, our, way, away, um, our way of business away from uh, take, make, and waste, and thinking about how we can make sure that that waste isn't hitting a landfill or change models so that a process doesn't generate any waste at all. It actually produces more, um, um, more valuable product um, or is recycled back. So a couple of examples coming from here. Um, I really love one of the projects that HP Canada has, has done. I think all of us will remember and is sometimes still the case. You can buy a printer with ink and it's cheaper than going and buying the ink. So that's a business model decision um, that HP had made or and other printer companies had made over, a over quite a, a period of time. But one of the transitions that uh, HP has made over the years is looking at a subscription service. So instead of selling someone a printer, they're selling them the ability to print and say, okay, we're gonna sell you a better printer, but ask that you subscribe to at the same price and ask that you subscribe to a refill for your, your ink. And so instead of offering a product that you're going to use and then dispose of yourself, you're purchasing a service and that printer can go back to HP for them to refurbish or dismember and uh, recycle back into the product. And they have an ongoing stream of income in terms of providing ink to their customers right when they need it. We're also seeing people think more about what is embodied carbon, what's going into the buildings that we're producing or the products we're producing. And again, that's all about these upstream and downstream impacts. And all of this is starting to come through in, in life cycle assessments, which have been around for a long time, but are getting more and more traction um, to, as a way to effectively measure and evaluate the different impacts of products and give consumers more of a tool in the future on how to make decisions uh, around products. And in particular, I think in supply chains and manufacturing, which is my background in helping um, uh, manufacturers think about what raw materials they're selecting and what inputs to their process they're choosing based on more than just cost. And uh, David, I'm going to ask you for a cue. I can wrap up. I can skip a section and wrap up. Um, what's best for time here? Uh, well, we are coming to the uh, to our lunch break. But if you want us a few more minutes to to continue, that's absolutely fine. But I would recommend wrapping up in about five minutes if you could. Yes, definitely. Thanks, David. You're welcome. Um, so maybe just a few more pieces that I'll touch on very briefly and jump to conclusion. Um, Outside of carbon mitigation, there's also um, the technologies that sequester carbon. Uh, there's our natural systems that do it, and also technology known as carbon capture utilization and storage um, that is emerging to take carbon out of the atmosphere and either store it, put it to use, or convert it to something else. And I think for small and medium-sized businesses, it's sometimes hard to connect to this because you probably don't have emissions at a stack. Um, but maybe your neighboring facilities do, and maybe you have a use for it. So I think the most concrete example I could, two concrete examples I could give around this is that we use CO2 in carbonated beverages, including beer production, and 
that CO2 could actually come from the atmosphere rather than being produced as a virgin material. So we could actually have recycled CO2 put into our carbonated beverages. Um, and that's a technology that's rapidly emerging and I think will be a really interesting example of how maybe the craft brew in brewing industry will adapt to, to that new supply opportunity. And another is in concrete. There's a company called Carbon Cure out in Halifax and they're, um, they are taking carbon out of the atmosphere and storing it into their concrete. It makes the concrete more durable, it lasts longer, um, and it reduces the, uh, the carbon that's actually needed in the, the process of producing concrete. It's pretty phenomenal uh, technology. And I'm gonna skip through a couple of slides here um, and just get into the last piece of how do you get started. And so Simon gave, I think, a brilliant uh, example of how Green Economy North can support businesses in this endeavor. Um, and the place to get started, in my opinion, is by measuring your impact, then um, looking for opportunities to reduce it and setting a target that you commit um, publicly and are held accountable by it to achieving, but also supported by your community in achieving. And I think that's the role that our green economy hubs across Canada provide, and that Green Economy North is, is very capable of providing businesses uh, across the northern region. And I'm excited to see them launch their new cohort in next year. So thank you. That's everything for me. Thank you so much, Danielle, for that. Uh, we, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, sorry we had to cut you off a bit near the end, but this just shows there's a lot to say on this topic, and there's, there's absolutely more to be said. So if you are interested in, in this and more, I highly recommend you contact Danielle. Uh, you can, um, I don't know if we have your email here on screen, Danielle. I want to quickly drop uh, how they can reach you. Yeah, so you can reach me through Simon, but also at Danielle at greeneconomy.ca. Um, and I'm happy to field any questions that come up afterwards. Wonderful. Okay, well, I'm, I have no doubt there will be follow ups. But for now, we must shuffle off to lunch for those who are eagerly waiting. Danielle, what a great way to end up and cap off the morning. So thank you so much for sharing uh, your time and, and knowledge with us today. Um, certainly, some follow up questions will be sent your way. Uh, to everyone else, we will be going on lunch break, uh, so we will be returning at one o'clock for a uh, discussion on the circular economy and insights brought back from the World Circular Economy uh, Forum, so we're pretty excited to share some information with you. Everyone stay with us at one o'clock, but for now, enjoy your lunch. Uh, enjoy some of that weather. Uh, it's not the perfect summery weather that Danielle had speculated for us to be outside, but it is, in fact, a pretty dang nice day for the season, so go outside and enjoy it, and we'll see you all at one o'clock.